Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, extraordinary to be here. And, uh, in fact, I'm going to share with you some special moments of my life. And this is uh, what I would like to share with you. I have never shared this before, at least in this way. And I'm going to tell you how special moments, very special moments in technology in the last years. Well, it's horrible because I am seeing that I'm very old. But, <laughs> well, extraordinary moments in these years have gone through, you know, my hands. And one of the things that you will immediately see is that my moments, to some extent, are your moments. There are going to be something special because you will see that we are talking about technology, but we are talking about people. And also we are talking about how people learn things in very bright, special mon moments, these stellar moments that I'm trying to remember for, uh, for you. Look, I'm going to start with the very, very beginning. 1976, I finished my high school. My grades were very good both in uh, technical, uh, technical areas and humanities. Two teachers coaching me. Well, one's trying to convince me that I have to get the uh, you know, technical area. Another one, humanities. Technology won, and I was finally a telecommunication engineer. But remember, in their mathematics book, Adolfo Negro was the name of this guy, the technical one wrote this. Science, Alberto, remember, science is something small compared with a man. In his hands could be a scepter or a breadstick. It depends on the man. And I remember always that thing. And in all these years, I have seen that more and more, everything that we are living independently of the technology is very much associated with us and how we manage this technology and how we deal with this technology. So look, this was in 1976. Something special happened months later. I arrived to the Polytechnic University in Madrid and suddenly I discovered that instead of having five years of career, I was going to have six. And when I started to see what was the reason of that, I discovered that a lot of courses talking about digital appeared in the new program. Digital. I said, well, what's that? One more year for me, you know, in the university. It, this was the first approach, as you can imagine. And suddenly I started to discover that some individuals with anticipation, with vision in that university, coming from MIT and coming from Stanford with a Fulbright Highs, decided that they were going to boost all the technology university or the technical university in Spain to the future. And this was going to be the expedition to the future. I remember, you know, the digital signal processing, the electronics instead being analog, analog being digital. And there is some special moment that I would like to share with you. When I finished my degree here, I went to MIT. And I was with Alan Oppenheim in the Lincoln Lab. And he was the master of digital signal processing. And he told me, look, Alberto, there is something special about digital. Because when you are dealing with digital, you are dealing with the soul of the signals. And this soul is very different to the shape, the analog shape that you have. And you can be almost like God. I really believe, he told me, that God made this world digital. This were the... This were. And, 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 and he told me, look, I want you to definitely believe me. Do you know about Caruso? And he told me, Caruso, yes, the old singer. Yes, Caruso. Look, this is how we know that he sang, you know, many, many years ago. He put me a record. Well, it was with a lot of noise, uh, not very good. And suddenly he told me, do you want me to explain you how really sound Caruso almost 100 years ago? And I said, yes. Look, I have made this back engineering, trying to reproduce, you know, this recording and the environment. And this is the real Caruso. He convinced me because the real Caruso was, well, something very, very special. And this was... 19, uh, well, more than 76. This was almost 82, that is when I finished you know, my degree. And suddenly, I was very lucky, and I arrived in HP. In HP, a company that was uh, you know, thinking, uh, making the future. And uh, suddenly, I started to realize that computers, the idea of computers, started to be fragmented. 
And they taught me that computers are more and more separated things that could be communicated. And they told me that this computer being spread, you know, could be even more powerful than any other thing. And it's the first time that I work with LANs. It's the first time that someone talked me about client server. That is basically what you have today in the smartphones and the cloud. And also the open systems, you know, the software that could be accessed by everyone with the standards. And, and I discover, of course, you know, the web. And I'm going to tell you a story. 1995, spring, I don't remember the day. It was Saturday, but I don't remember the number. And I went to HP to make some work in the morning. And I decided that, that my child, uh, Jaime, five years old at that time, was going to come with me. And uh, while I was working, I put him in front of a computer, 1995. And I told him, look, I'm going to show you something. And let me tell you if uh, you, know, you like it. Find something. He started to find something. I immediately remind a very equivalent scene many years ago in the 60s when I went with my father to his office and I was with a typewriter, not with a, <laughs> with a computer. And uh, suddenly I discovered that he started to search Power Rangers, Goofy, Disney, and suddenly Juan Soto, the CEO of the company, arrived there and they say, well, this is very innovative. Uh, uh, Alberto, you are bringing you know, your family here and so you are managing you know, your life, uh, private life while working because today is Saturday and they say, well, yes, it's exactly this. And uh, he went straight forward to Jaime and he asked him, hey, Jaime, what's this? And Jaime, five years old, answered, internet. And he asked him, and, and what is all about? He stopped and he said, well, it's a place where I can find everything. Because his world, his goofies, his Disney's was already there. 1995, five years old. And you know, at that moment I decided that I was going to expose systematically to all the digital environment, all my family. Because I realized that it was a gift of fortune, you know, to expose with freedom the people, you know, to all this uh, environment. And this is what I did. Very interesting history, Kodak. That year, this is another miniature of uh, this history. Uh, you know, uh, I remember that the CEO of Kodak, George Fisher, called me. And I went to Rochester. And he was coming from Motorola. And he was telling me, look, I want to transform, you know, this company because we have lost the digital imagine. So he told me, I'm going to move directly to the second derivative. I'm going to move directly, you know, to the next wave. And I remember, and even more understanding from, you know, what we see today, that he was talking to me about the cloud. And he was talking to me about educating the people in imagine around some special web pages, web services that they were going to introduce. Even in that situation, that person, George Fisher, the one that made Motorola, you know, in a great company uh, in the previous years, you know, was thinking in recovering, you know, and going to the second derivative. I had the opportunity, you know, in the 2000s of working in Prisa, the largest conglomerate in Spain. And I remember working with Juan Luis Cebrián that he told me one day, look, Alberto, <coughs> 10 years ago, we brought modernity to El País, the newspaper. I want to do exactly the same. And I told him, but, but you are in the media paradise today. You have everything. Yes, but, uh, you know, the present is going to keep moving more and more and more. And I'm going to tell you something. You know, when you think that everything is going to be the same, you're already old. So, uh, you know, we have to change this. And I remember that those days, the golden age of media, at that point, I started to see all the things that we see today, but in prototypes. It was exciting. But the most exciting thing was the vision, the passion, the value of these people trying to change and to move quickly. Well, after that, I went to, you know, the telecommunication golden age. And the telecommunication golden age, why? If you remember the man in the moon, if you remember the 60s, these were the golden age of space. But not necessarily the best spacecraft, not necessarily the best technology. But why the golden age? Why? Because we were pushing the technology to the limits and we were, we were imagining everything. 
when I arrived to Caltech, you know, time ago I remember that I was surprised because I saw a lot of pictures of very, very strange planes, very strange planes. And they told me, look, this is the golden gauge of uh, planes. It was in the 50s, more or less. Because as we didn't know at that time how was the shape of the best plane, because we didn't have computers, we did, decided to try with everything. And it was like a blossom of imagination, as a blossom of creativity. You cannot imagine the impact for me when behind the GPL, that is where, where I was going, you know, I was seeing, you know, all these, all these pictures. Well, I remember in these years that everything started to be wireless. Everything started to be people. Because for the first time, even more than internet, you know, we started to see the evolution of, of, of these people. There is something equivalent, you know, to the rise of Apple today, that was the rise of users, you know, with the, uh, you know, the, the, the mobile phones. And it was very special. I remember that there was very, a very important thing in education, is that everyone in the universities wanted to come to these initiatives because they knew, they perceived, they had passion, they realized that something special was going to happen around this new technology. And this was the golden age, you know, of telecommunications. The golden age of telecommunications is not ever more in the telecommunications, it's more in the players that Antonio has told us. Because there is a an strange, you know, uh, randomness in some of the things that people would like to be in the future and what they really are because as we have many players and we have a lot of people working with all these informations, the future sometimes surprises uh, anyone. Well, this is very special and this is very special because I'm not talking anymore about history, I'm talking about the present. One day, Ana Maria Llopis, that will join us later, came to my office and he told me, look Alberto, have you heard about uh, this book linked from Laszlo Barabasi? And I said, well, this would be wonderful because I was trying to spread the information of all the new services that we were generating in, uh, in, uh, in Amena, but not through advertising because I didn't have enough money to uh, spend on that. And suddenly I started to realize with, uh, you remember that book, The Tipping Point for Malcolm Gladwell, that, you know, in fact, what he was saying could be simulated in the network. And in fact, there was uh, the de facto spreading of the information of all the new things that we were doing. And then these are the words, you know, of our first conversation, because uh, through that advice, I call uh, Laszlo Barabasi, that was at that time, you know, one of the key persons with Duncan Watts in network science, and we started to have uh, a collaboration. What's interesting about this? Well, two things. Many of the, uh, uh, of the key elements of the technology in the last years has been associated with this collaboration, but the second thing is that there is a new way of seeing the networks. There are mathematics associated with the networks. You can apply engineering, you know, to the network in terms of knowing what's going to happen. For first time, you see that this is happening. And also, what is more important is that there is a new marketing segmentation. This is a mega component with a lot of links. This link is hypercommunication. And what is happening is that the behavior of the individuals are moving to a unique behavior as an average that is the average of the uh, cluster that you have here. A new segmentation that is based not on age, is based not on gender, is based not on where they are, is based on the strength of the connections on how they communicate. Well, intelligent dust. I remember, you know, that uh, one uh, year ago, I was uh, uh, with uh, one of the key guys in MIT, you know, that is working in uh, M2M networks. Eh? Uh, and uh, uh, it was very funny because he told me, it's going to be a special time associated with M2M. It's going to be a special time because the cost of the sensors is going down dramatically and everyone is going to be with sensors. And then, you know, there is an important sensor technology. This is important because we're thinking in the people networked, but things networked are something that are coming. Things that today are using are starting to use this, you know, energy, the distribution of energy and the impact of the electric car. Also water and food and also, as I'm going to explain you, health. We are going to live more, I will explain you later, but, you know, understanding, you know, the environment and doing something like a risk management by ourselves of this information, massive information that we are getting, is, are some of the trends. And this is 
something that we were talking, you know, yesterday, is that education. You know, there is something special. Where are the hubs in a world in which education is everywhere, in which we can communicate, in which we can ev have events like this? Where? Where is the power? Where is the new university? And I'm going to tell you something. Many, many, many years ago, there was something in Toledo, we talked yesterday, about the Escuela de Traductores, the School of Translators. You know that Toledo was something like a melting point, like a, a, a place in which, uh, you know, in a pacific way and richness way, the different uh, uh, cultures coexist. Jews, Muslims, Catholics. And also there was a special kind of university, let's call this way, that was the Escuela de Traductores. Where is this now in the network? Where is it going to be? Look, important, what I have told you. You know, wellness, wellness not being ill before it's expected, is the name of the game. And this is one of the key sustainable things that we are facing today. And wellness is seen more like a management of risk. So you are going to have a lot of information about the environment, and you are going to decide, and you are going to assure that you are going to be, uh, you know, healthy uh, in the future. Here I'm talking about very, very large projects with a large American campus university and also here in Madrid in which, you know, the most important thing is avoid people going to hospitals. And also the most important thing is, you know, the primary care. And the most important thing in primary care is education. And the tools that they are thinking are associated with education are exactly the tools that we are seeing in the net. So this is great. Well, one day Sandy Pentland, one of the directors of the Media Lab in MIT, uh, told me, look, I would like to invite you to a special session that we are running in the World Economic Forum. And it's about personal information. All our information is in the network. We don't even know all the information that we have in the network. Is it dangerous? Is it uh, valuable? And he told me, we really believe that we can get money, you know, from the information. That the user can benefit from this. And we think that we can do it in a safe thing. We think that it could be like the new money. And if this is the new money, where are the actors, where are the different players? Well, we need to build it in an open way, in an open source uh, way. And this is something that I ask you to watch because this information is going to be definitely the new currency of the digital world. And finally, you know, there is a last transformation in internet and it's the TV. We are all TV, uh, TV, uh, you know, uh, uh, generation, more or less, but we are, you know, associated with TV. Something soon will change just because of the evolution of the uh, uh, compression algorithm. Something very similar to ADSL could have appear from many sources and uh, we are going to have images everywhere and this is going to change and this is going to have an impact, a great impact in education. And finally, you know, Stefan Zweig, you know that he wrote uh, a book, Stellar Moments of Humanity, and I really wanted to take his words and say, well, anything essential, anything that lasts, emerges in a few and extraordinary moments of inspiration. Stellar moments of history, bright and unalterable, like stars. Remember something, remember something. These moments are, in this moment of networks, in this world of networks, all of us are part of these, uh, of these moments. All of us are parts of this moment. And remember something else, is that, you know, this present is going to be moving. Never will be still. So this is the great opportunity and this is the fascinating thing. And to give you my final words, I really believe that the same feeling that I had at the beginning of the history that I shared with you is exactly what I have today because, you know, happiness is very much associated with knowing that in the future things will be different and we can participate in making this happen. Thank you very much.